Special coverage from the Vancouver Resource Investment Conference is brought to you by Victoria Goldcorp. Welcome back to SOAR Financial. You welcome back to the Vancouver Resource Investment Conference. My name is Kai Hoffman. I'm the at JR Mining Guy on Twitter and the CEO of SOAR Financial. Thank you so much for joining us here for yet another interesting discussion here on the floor of the conference. And I'm joined by Cam Curry, Senior Investment Advisor over at Canaccord Genuity and also the head of Curry Metals and Mining. Yes. Cam, first time. Great to see you. Thanks so much for joining yeah. us. Thank you very yeah, much. Really there. appreciate that. All the gives a very handshake there. Yeah. Um, how's the mood? Let's start there. Well, the mood is tapered to say the least. And I think, uh, you know, anybody in, in the sector right now would, would herald the same thing. You know, I think one of the biggest issues, again, in the precious metals right now is people are looking at the fact that gold's near all-time highs and the equities are trading near, near the lows and the disconnect. Every time I have a conversation with clients, corporates, uh, institutions, what's the disconnect all about? What's, what's the market telling us? Is there, is there something we should be worried about? And we look at it from a totally opposite per- perspective. We look at the value opportunity. And you know, what you've got right now is a situation where people are chasing U.S. equities again after you know, being hammered at them going to 2022. They're back chasing the muscle memory of that investment theme. And gold is near its all-time highs. There's no money flows coming in. And that's really the narrative that's yeah. out there. And we will probably have to drill down on that a little bit. Totally. Yeah, let's, totally. You know, I see a lot of question marks walking around here because everybody's puzzled. Yes. We're trading at 21 or what is it, 2040. Uh, gold announced, mm-hmm. and as he said, nobody's really paying attention. Yeah. Even mainstream media didn't pay attention when we broke all-time highs Well, gold. You know what's interesting to note, though? The media and Western world, okay? If you look at uh, the world, gold, uh, gold Council just published uh, last week that uh, in China, the second best performing asset class for investors was gold, up 13% in their currency. So the Eastern world gets gold. They see the value of gold as a reserve currency, a store of value, a de-dollarization move. The Western world's not even paying attention to that and if they're not paying attention to that, why would they pay attention to the equities? And so, the, so there's a whole audience of people that aren't paying attention to what the world's saying right now. I've been saying that in other interviews as well. It feels like there's been a memo that was sent out to everybody in the Western world, so like, don't buy gold. Yeah. Especially to the central banks. Yes. Because they didn't buy any. Yes. Like, they're Poland, maybe, and Ireland, I think. They sort of disobeyed mm-hmm. uh, the, the world order, apparently. Mm-hmm. Right? But it's all the Eastern nations, like, mm-hmm. as mentioned, China and all the others. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's like, Thailand con- completely wants to back its uh, currency. Mm-hmm. Turkey. Not, sorry, not Turkey. Turkey. But it's uh, currency reserves. Yes. It's gold. Yeah. Right? So, there's that disconnect. Mm-hmm. Uh, totally. Totally. Uh, we're not seeing it. Like we, we talked about it earlier before hitting the record, like there's no money flowing into the mining sector mm-hmm. either. I and mean, we're seeing it here as well. <laughs> like let's, let's drill down on that. Like uh, where did the money go? Well, I mean, a speculator in Canada, I mean, Canada traditionally has had a very big investment culture as investors. I go back 20 years ago, everybody invest, invested in resource companies. Then other types came along. So we had the cannabis, the digital, the, the US technology companies and that. So money has been migrating out of the country and speculative money chased all these other, other sectors as well. But it's not just the retail investors. You look at the funds. You look at the fund allocation into resource companies in Canada. It's been in decline now for 15 years. And so they're chasing other sectors now and they've kind of left, left the resource space. So if our own uh, funds aren't buying our resources, you know, there's, the, the, you gotta ask yourself, where are the other buyers? No. Well, we're going to talk about we compare Canada to Australia because oh, you got the super funds, uh, super annuation funds, yeah, huge. So is that something Canada should introduce? It's like we got the, the flow through with the scheme, but yeah, that's definitely flow through small compared to those things. Yeah. The se- super annuation funds right now are they're saying they're going to go from three and a half to seven trillion dollars in the next five years, and those funds have a mandate to invest in resources as well. So a portion goes into funds. The, I was reading the other day that uh, the two biggest lithium companies that in in, in uh, Australia have more investments from the super funds than all the funds in Canada investing in resource companies. So w- there's no mandate. There's no objective, right? But don't forget, the big thing about Australia, they don't have the compete of America beside them. So they just, they look at the investment world of Australia and the resources. They're not being distracted by the other sectors like we are here. And that's a big component to it all. Oh, well, we have to address that topic because we're seeing a changing world order. Uh, to come back to that term, uh, but everybody's saying, "Well, we got to bring production home. We got to bring uh, we're sourcing materials back home as well." Canada playing a big role in it. Mm-hmm. I think the U.S. is trying to completely decouple from the Chinese supply chain uh, on the critical mineral side as well, and Canada plays a big part. Like, what needs to change, Cam? Well, okay, so let's let's jump into the feasible. Let's oh, okay. let's jump into the copper role for example for for a moment here because that's the biggest issue. If you look at China, they've been basically 
globalizing the world through asset uh, purchases and investments. And so they control a lot of the offtakes in that in the copper market. The United States, we were involved with a project in Arizona, and um, to get permits for building a copper mine in the United States, and yet they're trying to evolve into a green world. Well, uh, copper is required, but we don't want to mine it in our own backyard. There's a big problem with that. And so copper on the supply side is a huge problem going forward. Uh, thing is, though, coppers are 4 or $5 a pound. Price is one thing, but getting securing supply is most important. And Asia has been you know, basically aligning themselves with supply side contracts, right? It's a big problem. And the U.S. is giving out grants to certain projects as well. Mm -hmm. But it's not really a substitute. We discussed superannuation funds. No. It's not really a substitute because it doesn't instigate buying in the market no. necessarily, no. right? Um, how do you see that developing as well? Because the Canadian product, companies and certain projects are also eligible for what is Sprats. Yeah, you know, again, I don't follow that flow that closely, quite honestly, because when we're uh, raising money at Canico Genuity for mining companies, you know, we're going to the, to the wealth funds and that. They're are looking for allocations in, into, the, uh, into the resource equities. So I don't really follow that that closely. But, you know, you take a, a page out of what Australia has done with the superannuation funds, and to have something that in Canada, in, it's just where a portion has to be invested in, in domestic projects, is an endorsement to the investment world that Canada is a mining country. And, you know, we're, we're the, we're the, we have been recognized as the mining capital of the world, and yet we're not getting that validation of that narrative or that promotion on the world stage as that. Whereas Australia is well known for that. There's a huge opportunity here. If you were to raise a million dollars tomorrow, mm -hmm. where would you raise it? And uh, maybe we can break it down as well, like percentage-wise. Is it just from funds, retail investors, high net worth, meaning asset managers, family offices? Here is uh, if that's changed over the last 12, 24 months as well. Well, I deal with high net worth family offices, and so I have a, I have my group of clients that I work with. And so if I find something I really, really like, then I can that I can raise some money in that. But just to have perpetual inflows of money right now, we aren't seeing that. You know, you know, you, I've talked to a number of funds. Well, they, they haven't had any inflows. In fact, they're getting redemptions. They'd be forced to sell some of their good stocks because they're liquid. And so it's, it, you know, we've seen this before, but I've never seen this before with a commodity trading at all-time highs. I mean, that's the biggest mind twist for most investors is they just, and I think it's so discouraged people that it's really, it's really made it challenging, right? Did the mining industry itself make mistakes? Oh, of course. I mean, every every sector in a bull market back in 2012 were overpaying for assets, and you know th that a lot of ways that's behind us now. But in the board of directors of these mining companies, they still carry that brand in their mind about those mistakes. That's why M and A hasn't been as strong and powerful. And um, the other thing too is that getting really good human resource talent. The industry is getting more and more challenged with good quality people, and so there's been more hiccups in the mining industry, right? And uh, can you look at $2,000 gold, you kind of go, well, how come this company isn't making it work, right? Um, challenging assets, lower grade assets. Again, supply is a big problem. And, and that's one of the other things too, and whether it's copper or gold, new mines coming down the pipeline to meet demand just aren't at the rate they were. They're at the size they were. So there's gonna be a supply side issue in both at some point. Just looking around the conference here, is there anything these companies could do better to attract capital or investors? Because I look at it, it's like they're like our booth. Everybody's got the same roll-up. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Everybody's got the same thing. Is there anything they could do differently or better? Well, and uh, I think the big thing, like, you know, I've been um, spending a lot of time with World Gold Council, uh, David Tate, Randy Smallwood. And, uh, and the biggest, biggest thing that the industry needs to do is have a collective narrative. Right? So a number of my corporate clients now, when they do a presentation institutions and that, they all they incorporate a, a portion of that presentation about why gold, why now. Because okay. you have to understand, why the, why, the, why the asset in the first place and why our company in the second place. Yeah. And I think you need to, we need as a group to be a collective voice. And uh, I've said this in numerous interviews that if you're in a stadium with 60,000 people and everyone's focused on the field down below where, where Bitcoin is and, and Nvidia and Apple and Microsoft and there's 10 people up in the nosebleed section trying to get the wave going and that's the precious metal sector, no one's paying attention. You have to get to a 50, you have to get a critical mass where people go, wait a second, what's going on over there? So the industry has to be collective in, a, in their messaging. Because again, going back to gold ownership in, in the autocracies of the, of the world, those central banks continue to buy gold and they're divesting of US dollars. And I think if that theme, that 
that, that understanding got into the investor's mindset and they recognized why they're buying it and why gold, you know, which is a reserve currency, is attractive as a long-term asset for your portfolio, then the shift would happen, then there'd be conversation, the narrative, and therefore, therefore the money flows into the equities. It's a collective thing. Okay, like we've all seen the Idris Elba documentary yes. as well called Cunts yes. put out. I think that's, that's been beneficial. I think at least a lot of people have seen it. Mm -hmm. So I'm curious if that changes the narrative a little bit as well. It's beneficial, but there's a lot more to coming on the pipe. Um, yeah. Again, um, I actually uh, moderated a fireside chat between Randy Smallwood and, and David Tate at the Idris Elba yeah. debut. And, um, you know, what the World Gold Council is doing is a long-term plan. And they've made great, great strides. And so we're seeing some big wealth groups now recognizing through their initiative, you know, why gold has to be part of your portfolio. No. And Randy Smallwood is such a great voice and crusader for the industry because he connects that gold is one thing, but the gold equity is the disconnect. So he's connecting the two. And again, they're one group, but there's so many more groups and voices that have to come forward because it's a critical mass. Like anything, it's critical mass, right? Yeah. It's always 10% move uh, 90% of the market, or is it? I mean, yeah. Or you need 10% to 90% follow. But, but I think I think the big thing is you, you need a narrative, right? The narrative, we used to have guys like Sean Boyd and, and Pierre Lasson and that get up and you had a, a voice you were hearing all the time. World Gold Council has some great ads on TV, you know, when you watch a football game and that, but it's inconsistent. There's such a propensity yeah an opportunity to create a, uh, a theme behind gold as, a, as an asset class. Like in India, for example, it's, it's, it's a value of wealth, stature, possession, passion, uh, respect. Um, and so there's so many positive attachments to it. Whereas you ask some people about gold, they think, oh, it's, it's something you put in your bunker, right? But it's an asset class that's, that's proved the test of time and has a purchasing power that no other currency can surpass. And it has to be sold like that as an investment. Right. What type of projects do you throw your weight behind right now? And because uh, maybe a bit of background on the question is at Oran Inc. we track financing data. And yes. We look at uh, the all aspects of the market and the early stage grassroots explorers are dead. Yeah. Let's be honest. They're dead. They can't raise a penny right now. Mm -hmm. It's all the late stage developers or explorers that are raising all the cash. Right. So I'm curious um, where you're throwing your money. Well, you know, or not throw, sorry, you're weight behind. Yeah. So junior explorers, I feel for them right now because there's some really good people trying to do the right things um, and you just can't raise money. Um, I wait for a discovery and then I monitor it and see the progression and then make a decision whether we come in or not. I'm a developer, small producer going to mid-tier yeah. player. Uh, just recently, Caliber took over Marathon. I'm very instrumental in those two coming together and my investors and myself are the cornerstones, biggest cornerstones in the new co. That makes sense. You have a, you have a 280,000 ounce producer buying a 200,000 ounce producer under construction going to half a million ounce. Now you're a mid-tier. So now you, you will get recognized in a different category, which should bring in a lot of money flows, right? That, those are my focuses, you know? Producers, like another comp company we're involved with, 150,000 ounce producer, going to 250, but they want to buy another asset and become a mid-tier. So they're unlocking value through growth, uh, exploration, um, expansion, and you have to be in a story like that these days, because if you're just in that flat line, like trying to put a million ounce closed off deposit into production right now, it's gonna take you four years to get permitted. It's like call me in four call, years. Call me in three yeah. Years. yeah. Which is really unfortunate because these people have done a lot, a lot of work. Yeah. Right? And it's expensive too. It, it's very expensive. It's cost a ton of money. And geopolitical risks, yeah. you know, all that kind of stuff. And and then, you know, the other thing too is that um, you also if you if you're such a small cap, you don't get any index weightings. And nowadays, algos and ETFs and indexes drive so much of the volume. And most investors don't know that. But you look at U.S. equities, 85, 90% of the volumes are ETF and indexes and algos. The right? chairman of Caliber, uh, Blaine Johnson, mentioned to me yeah. five years ago, he said, Kai, whenever I do a new deal, it needs to be immediately index relevant. Has to. Oh, I, keep rem I remember that sentence. Like we were standing in Miami at the BMO conference. Mm -hmm. He's like, first thing he said to me, pretty much. So I was like, okay, and that struck with me. It does it make sense. Yeah, but how do you get from there to there? Not everybody can do it. And that's, that's one of the problems with the, the, the ex junior explorers and, and the small discovery stories and that. Unless you get some sponsorship and some real energy behind you. And there's very few people concentrating in the space. I mean, there's a lot of people walking around here. But getting, getting a, a following of, of, of investors that can make a big difference, it's extremely challenging these days. Yeah. Let's zoom out. We've talked a lot of micro. Yep. I really quickly want to talk macro as well because yep. it feels like the financing window for the grassroots explorers really shut 
March 2022. I'm mm-hmm. seeing the Fed, the first Fed rate hike. Mm-hmm. That's where it really felt like, okay, we're done. No more. The risk capital is gone. Mm-hmm. Um, what needs to change on the macro level? Is it uh, Jerome Powell saying, okay, we're cutting rates now by a percent or by 100 basis points uh, quickly? Is there any external triggers that could uh, kind of start a rally in mining stocks? Well, I think the, <laughs> the fundamental uh, events are taking place, but they're taking a lot long to come through on the economy and the consumer. And I think in the United States, for example, when you have a 25 year, two and a half percent mortgage, rates go up, you can still continue on. COVID also created a whole different environment too, because all the stimulus that went into the system, liquefying, chasing assets. And you also had a mindset of investors that just wanted to live and be present and spend money, spend money. And so they've had a lag effect. If you look at the leading economic indicators, we're 20 months in a row of declining the economic indicators. You look at employment numbers, they've revised either the last employment numbers down. So unemployment's going up. So I still in the camp that we're going to recession. And I think when the recession happens, don't forget this year in the United States, they had a $2 trillion deficit with record low unemployment. You're not supposed to run a deficit of $2 trillion at, at low- The economy's at, apparently doing well. Exactly. So what happens next year or the year after if we do have a slowing economy, or I think we'll have a stagflation economy, and all of a sudden your deficit goes from two to two and a half to three and your interest costs, like there's $17 trillion where the treasuries have to be refinanced in the next 30 months. So we're, where's, the, where's the money coming from to keep on refinancing at higher prices and the burden on the government in terms of interest costs? So I think all that leads to continuing decline of the US dollar. And I think as the dollar declines, I think gold will, will make a rightful position. Gold's trading near highs or all time highs in a lot of currencies in the world right now. It's just that. North Americans look at it in dollars, and they and they look at their economy thinking they're doing great, and yet I think we're slowly slipping into this recession. I think I know in Canada because we have five-year mortgages. This year is going to be a tough year. A lot of mortgages, 30% of mortgages, fixed rate come due this year, and I think there's a lot of people who are going to look at their mortgage and go, "Holy shit!" No, quantum jump, and that's going to really hurt the economy. Yeah. So macro sense, I think it's slowly playing out taking a lot longer than I would have thought. Most economists last year thought the U.S. was going to recession. All of them were wrong. I think the recession is there. It's just the data is not. Well, it also depends a bit on the sector you look at. Oh, totally. Well, right? So there's massive divergence. Co- uh, commercial real estate is one. A lot of empty office space. 19% office space in the United States. Construction workers are suffering as well. Yeah. Uh, but you also PMIs are down. Re- re- regional board. banks. Look at the regional bank problems that still exist. I mean, you look at the um, the use of uh, buy now, pay, pay in inter apps yeah. in the United States. 40% increase over Christmas. So people are stretching themselves more and more, thinking that the interest rates are going to come down, they'll be fine. And so that's the mindset of today's consumer. And, and you know, credit card debt, all-time highs. I mean, all this stuff is there. To us, it's obvious that we're going to have a slowing consumer and, a res- and, and perhaps a recession, and then who knows where we go from there. And I think when that happens, then the, the worry of the U.S. fiscal situation becomes a worry. And, you know, again, one of the things is most people look at gold this way, but the three largest reserve currencies in the world are the U.S. dollar, the euro, and gold. And gold's the only one that has no debt obligation. The U.S. has $34 trillion in debt with a printing press. And you can't dilute it. And there's uh, no political attachment. So that's why these eastern banks continue to buy it, because they're looking at what is, from the outside, looking in at what's going in America. And they're saying, I want to diversify the U.S. dollars. Like Grant Williams had said in your chair like a half an hour ago, and he said, gold is a national security asset now. Yeah. Well, it's going to be the title of my YouTube video with him as well. Yeah. So. <laughs> you know, it, it, in some ways, it, it is. I mean, if you really look at, like, going back to Idris Alba's uh, uh, movie in, uh, from World Gold Council, you know, paper currency came out as an IOU against your gold holding. So fiat currencies came out of gold. And if you look at what happened with debt in the United States after they came off the gold center in 71, the debt level has gone exponential. Because there's no... Yeah, diminished. Yeah. So what you've had is you've had basically a leverage uh, and printing press of dollars and debt level of, uh, for dollars. And ironically now, central banks are now forf- giving back those U.S. dollars yeah. and taking gold. So they're in essence going back to a gold standard themselves. That's why China continues to buy. Russia, Turkey, Middle East. So if you really look at it from that perspective, if that got some narrative theme behind it, investors thought, gee, I'm buying something that's actually a reserve currency that is tangible and has no, no third party obligation. That sounds attractive. But we need a sector, going back to your question before, we need, we need a whole sector to talk about it. I mean, I mean, we all see the values in our space. I mean, it's incredible how cheap these stocks are. 
you see the value of gold as an asset class. But as a group, collectively, we have to tell the world, because unless there's critical mass, there's no momentum, okay. no narrative. It's January, so it's a bit of an unfair question, but do you see the mood change at all this year? Is there a chance for that? I'll tell you where I see the mood change. I see a lot of people I've known, because I deal with a lot of senior mining guys, that are just like, I can't believe these things are that cheap. And I don't know, if you look at textbooks out of any bull market, bear market, they're all cyclical. But when the insiders of the industry, the smart guys, are saying these things are just so cheap, the rest of the world should use that as an opportunity to say, you know what, maybe I should be looking at that sector. You know, it's not like you've got um, Elon Musk saying Tesla's cheap or Bill Gates saying Microsoft cheap, right? But when the insiders of the sector are saying, I can't believe how cheap the sector is, I sat down with one of the iconic industry um, members, I won't give his name, he's out in New York, and I uh, had lunch with him two months ago, and he said, you know, in my 45 years in the business, I've never seen such a disconnect between gold equity values and gold. And this guy is a very influential individual. So when people like that are saying that, so you should be paying attention. So going back to your question, there's a recognition, there's a mood of optimism, but people are going, why isn't anybody else paying attention? Yeah. Well, the optimism is always there, genuine. Right? Yeah. That's why it's a bit of an unfair question. Right. I'm always, I'm like, everybody's excited, new year, a bit of rise in volume. We've seen the markets just a little bit, nothing too outrageous. Mm -hmm. So everybody's happy, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. But then uh, the PDAC, act, which is six weeks from now, well, so you get whacked up. The PDAC death, yeah. Right? The curse of PDAC. <laughs> uh, last question, Cam, is like, are we going to see more M&A this year as well? We've seen a lot of consolidation, or quite a bit of consolidation. But, well, uh, well, it's interesting because they, you know, John Goodman and I were on a panel at our, our, our Catacorn Mining Conference down in, in um, um, Pond Springs last year. And the question was odd up. And he and I were both adamant about saying no. Because a lot of our core holding positions that we have, uh, his diff in the mine and some cross, um, they're trading at point two times now. And they've done great jobs of building these companies that are marching towards production or expansion or whatever. And um, the other companies are 0.8 times now and that, and so they could scoop these things down up quite quickly. We don't want that to happen. We want to unlock the value before we get any tension. You want tension in the boardrooms to happen. The answer to the question is, there will be. I mean, you saw Caliber take over a marathon. That was a, that was a one plus one equal five in our view. And so those make sense to us. But for companies that have more expensive currency to start sniping off some of these juniors, we don't want that to happen. Because if you really look at it, I'm sure you can attest this, there's so few assets moving down the pipe to this guy making meaningful production uh, uh, in, in the next two to three years. There were so many companies that traded at a dollar, just as an example. They're trading at 25 cents now, and they get a takeout offer for 35 cents. Yeah, yeah. I know. Right. So, I know. As a basic mouse. But that's the problem, is that a lot of these guys, they just like, people are getting beaten up, you know? They're, they're exhausted. And if you can't raise capital, you either get taken over or you do a very dilutive equity raise. I've right? seen one of those who's throwing the towel MA acquisitions last week. Yeah. I want to name it. Yeah, yeah. That's yeah. my yeah. estimate of and that transaction. And you like, know okay, what? Throw in the, they rub the hands, we're done. Yeah. Let's just take us out. We're done. See, so, you know, I, I probably have eight core big holdings, and they're all with manager teams I've worked with in the past who have delivered great success. I'm a big believer in going to successful managed teams that have a track record so they know what they're doing. They have the expertise because money is tough. To actually make it make it work, there's a lot of speed bumps out there. And uh, so, you know, when you, you can buy a lot, be alongside these manager teams, who by the way, have put a lot of their own personal money in and are buying alongside me in the marketplace, people putting their money where their mouth is, up and the assets and the management team tick the boxes, those are the type of clients we deal with. Yeah, you toss them. Yeah. We got to wrap it up here. Yeah. Uh, fantastic conversation. Where can we find more of your work? Where can we follow you? Where can we reach out to you? Yeah, um, I'm Kenny Cordinuity, uh, Curry Metals and Mining Group. Uh, you can just uh, look me up uh, on my website. Uh, you, you'll get uh, clarity on my deck and my experience, my track record. And uh, if you have any questions, feel reach out and we'll set up an appointment. Fantastic. Awesome. Thank you so much for your time. Really appreciate it. Thank you. Thanks for stopping by and to everybody else. Thank you so much for joining us here on at the booth on the Vancouver. Yeah. Uh, at the booth at the Vancouver Resource Event. Right? Proper propositions. Got to do it. Thank you so much for joining us. Hit that subscribe button. It's been a long day, a long two days actually already. So leave a comment, leave a like. Why, why do you think the mining stocks aren't moving? Do you think gold is going to explode this year as well? Are they going to move together? Let us know. We do want to hear from you. And uh, we'll be back with lots more here from Vancouver. Thank you so much.